we're going to get going. I uh, appreciate uh, people coming to an interim hearing. Uh, I know there's a lot of things going on, and the leaves are finally falling off the trees. Um, and uh, like, what was that about? Anyway, it was so nice. Um, what a nice autumn we've had, and a glorious day to come. Um, we have a, a significant agenda today. Uh, we have, um, of course, the marquee topic that we'll talk about with the uh, substance discussion and how that impacts uh, DHS even in a larger way. We're going to talk about some good news with the Inspector General's reform and some amazing Six Sigma redesign, which I see as the ray of hope. And then we're going to talk about, uh, not, they're, not, they're not minor, we're going to look into a brief review of waiver reimagined electronic visit verification and then the, uh, the uh, high uh, percentage elderly waiver grants. And it's my desire to get out of here by about noon. And so we're not going to solve everything today. Maybe people thought this was like the day to solve it. But um, we're going to certainly start the process rolling and, and have a really, uh, I think, robust discussion about the first matter particularly, and then uh, move the, the rest of the items. And depending on what comes out of here, we'll decide if we're going to have any more hearings yet this year. There may be a need for another one. I don't imagine that would be in November. It'd probably be first part of December if we did do something, and that's totally um, yet to be determined. And, and so this is, um, as we have said, as I've said for a year and a half, this is not a witch hunt. It's not an effort to find somebody doing wrong. It's an effort to make a department work that serves so many key people and has so many uh, great employees. And, um, and so uh, we're going to hear from the... Uh, the, the auditor, and then the commissioner is going to come up and comment, and then we'll hear from the tribes, and then I think we'll move into some discussion after that. So that's the plan. So welcome to the uh, Mr. Nobles. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the Joint Committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present our report. I would first like to uh, introduce you to the other people that worked on this review. The team included Elizabeth Stowicki, who is in the audience, our legal counsel, also, uh, Joel Alter, who is the director of our special reviews, and Valerie B Bombach, who is an audit director in the financial audit division of OLA. Mr. Chairman, uh, you said there's going to be some, some good news, and I'm glad to hear that. Unfortunately, my job is to deliver some of the bad news. But let's start where many of us start today. I do, and maybe some of you do as well. Opening up the, the medicine cabinet taking out a prescription bottle, pouring out a couple of tablets, getting a glass of water, and taking that medication. That's what we're really here to talk about. Now, what normally will happen, certainly happens with my insurance company and probably with yours, or even if you're on a, a government uh, program, the payment will be made for when you go to the doctor. And the doctor makes a diagnosis and determines what you need and then may prescribe medication. And then you're going to go to the pharmacy, and your insurance company is going to pay for that bottle of tablets. Now, what we are here to talk about is the fact that, and it is a problem, that the Department of Human Services was paying for when, you, when people from White Earth and Leech Lake, uh, clients in the tribal opioid addiction treatment programs, we're doing what you may have done this morning and what I did, and that is getting that medicine bottle out of the medicine cabinet and self-administering a dose of medication. Again, normally, there's no payment for that because there's no direct service between a health provider and the client. But DHS decided that it would pay the opioid treatment programs run by White Earth Nation and the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe every time one of their clients self-administered an opioid addiction treatment medication. In fact, uh, they were paying a significant amount of money for each time that occurred. They were paying what is referred to as the Indian Health Service encounter rate. Currently, that is $455. So just to be explicit, they were paying every time a person opened the medicine cabinet, took medication, self-administered it, the department was paying the opioid treatment programs of the two tribes $455 every time a client did that. In fact, the tribes were told 
by officials at the Department of Human Services that they could receive those payments. That was direction and guidance that the department gave. They even gave the tribes the billing code to make those payments happen. That went on for a number of years. But in February, another tribal opioid treatment program that was not receiving the payments, White Earth Nation asked a person, the opioid treatment expert at the Department of Human Services, can we too receive that payment, that $450 payment when our clients self-administer medication? And the person at DHS said yes, because that had been the established practice over a number of years. Fortunately, there was someone else in the department, the department's Indian liaison officer, who saw that communication, and he said, I don't think that's right, because there are policies that we have that say that we can only pay the Indian Health Service encounter rate if there is an encounter, if there is an interaction between the client and the healthcare professional, and that's not happening. So he said to Red Lake, wait until we give you an official response. We need to really do some work at the department. We need to do some research. We need to do some findings of facts on where did this come from that this other person told you that you could receive this payment. So for a number of weeks, the department went through an internal process of trying to find out what was the origin of this policy that had been going on for a number of years. The department couldn't find out where the department, where the department made that decision, who made it, when it was made. They only knew that they had sent out a lot of payments to the two tribes that were receiving the encounter rate. So they told the tribes, we can no longer do this. We can no longer give you this payment. And they waited until, frankly, May the 1st to send that notification to not only Red Lake, but also to White Earth and Leech Lake. So it took them quite a while. And I think one of the disturbing things is that they kept making the payments, even after they had decided that those payments were not in compliance with legal requirements. So from sometime in February, early March, when they decided, no, these payments are not in compliance with legal requirements, they kept making the payments until the 1st of May, when they notified the three tribes that they cannot receive those payments. And then it took several more weeks, in fact, several months, before they then notified White Earth and Leech Lake, you actually have to pay us back all of the payments that we've made to you over the years. And for each of those tribes, White Earth, Leech Lake, that amounts to $14.5 million per tribe. So this situation at DHS has created a lot of tension between the state and the tribes. In fact, it is really, I think, uh, caused the tribes to really question how is it that we are now going to be held responsible for something that you told us over the years was okay. So we reviewed how this all happened. And uh, we interviewed over two dozen people, interviewed uh, lots of officials at DHS, former and current. We interviewed them under oath. We reviewed a lot of documents. And we came to the conclusion that it was dysfunction at DHS that caused this problem. That's a strong word, dysfunction. And some people might say, what justifies you calling them a dysfunctional, at least in this particular situation? Well, here are the facts. They had no authority to make these payments. They started making these payments, by the way, back a number of years ago to non-tribes. Not as much, certainly not the 455, but a smaller amount of money around 20, 22, $23 over the years. But they didn't have any authority to do that either. And so we don't think it's functioning properly when the Department of Human Services somewhere, sometime, decides to start making payments that they don't have authority to make. 
Also, when we talk to officials from DHS and we ask them, well, aside from not having authority, maybe you had a policy rationale. Maybe there's a reason you did this. No one had a rationale for why the department was paying providers, clinics, for their clients to self-administer medication. Another troubling thing was that there was no documentation. The department could not find out who made this decision, when it was made, what the rationale was, what the authority was. There was no documentation for this. And we couldn't find it either. Even though we looked through hundreds and hundreds of documents, emails, official documents, all kinds of documents, we couldn't find anything. And we continually ask, what's the documentation? And then we ask in the interviews, do you know who made the decision? And everybody said no. And nobody raised their hand and said, I made the decision. I'm responsible. So it's disturbing again to us that this could occur. Now, even though the decision was made incorrectly at some point by somebody, there were others in the department that could have prevented the payments from being made. Because the department has policy that says we can only make an encounter payment when there is a face-to-face -face encounter between a client and a healthcare professional. And in 2014, the department actually required the tribes to designate on the claim form that they submitted for the payment, where was this medication administered? And the tribes were saying, at home. So the claim form said clearly, we are claiming that 455 for a self-administered dose of medication by the client at home. The department had a policy that said, we don't pay an encounter rate. But nobody went over into the payment system and put in a code that said, when that column reads at home, we don't make a payment. In fact, they kept making the payments until May 1st, 2019. So they didn't have a control to stop the payments. And they didn't stop the payments from any internal review. Any review by their internal auditors, by the SERS unit. And I must say, we didn't find that issue either. And so I feel some sense of culpability that we weren't here before you two years ago, four years ago. But frankly, this was something that we think should have been caught by the people who are in DHS every day. And there are a lot of people who had an opportunity to stop the payment and say, we can't do this. This is a little chart I put together, uh, very fancy work on my part in terms of uh, cutting and pasting together. Just the, uh, the vertical chain of command in that part of the department. Now, as you know, the department or, or chart stretches over here and over here, but I just cut out the chain of command for where this occurred. And the person who was giving the instruction to White Earth, Red Lake, and Leech Lake is down here. Between this gentleman who was giving the direction and up here at the commissioner's level, you can see there are many, many supervisors. There are directors, there are assistant commissioners, there are deputy commissioners. There are a lot of people. And then over here, there were even more people who could have put that code in the payment system. None of that happened. That's why we call this a dysfunction. A dysfunction in supervision, oversight, and control. So what is the result that we're left with? We're left with a very serious problem, a financial problem and a legal problem that belongs to the state because the state spent $29 million of federal money. All of this is federal money. And, this, and the federal government has provisions that say when you spend money uh, from Medicaid, that isn't appropriate authorized, 
when it's out of compliance, you have to pay us back. And that's pretty firm. And then there are also provisions in state law that say, DHS, when you make an overpayment, an unauthorized payment, even if it's your mistake, the people that you gave that money to, they have to pay it back. So the department has said to White Earth and Leech Lake, you have to come up with the money, you have to pay us back. That's what state law requires. And so as this plays out over time, this could end up as a fairly complicated and difficult problem to resolve and could involve quite complex and contentious litigation. So what do we recommend? Well, we recommend that the legislature, and we don't often do this, we don't recommend that the legislature mandate internal controls within a department. We think that's the responsibility of the department. But the situation here was so fraught with problems um, that we think you should mandate that the commissioner of the Department of Human Services design and implement a comprehensive system of basically supervision, of review and approval that will be documented, where when a decision is made over here or down here, that these people who are there every day as supervisors, they have to sign off. They have to say, yes, I'm gonna put my name on this. This complies with law. I approve it. The situation we found is there's no documentation that anybody ever approved this policy. That ought to end. There ought to be sign-offs. All of these people should take responsibility and there should be transparency for who approved this. So that's what our recommendation is. I have visited with the commissioner. She's gonna visit with you. She's starting to implement this recommendation. Another recommendation to the legislature, you, we think you should clarify whether the department even has the authority to pay a service fee when a client self-administers medication. This is unusual. This is something, as I say, the department started some years ago. Now, they will tell you, and it's correct, they've stopped the payments to the tribes. But the payments to the non-tribes continue. And we think this sets a precedent that you ought to discuss. I know you're gonna be considering the insulin uh, issue. So will the department establish that home administration of insulin will receive a payment? According to the department, they do have some general authority that they could do that. We think that this is something you should discuss and decide. And then our last recommendation. As I said, there is a state law that says the department, even if it made the mistake, even if it made egregious mistakes, that it has to get the money back from the provider to whom they paid the money. We think that you probably enacted that for good reason. There are times when mistakes are made in a department. I've seen them. The department has a, a payment to a vendor, $10,000, and there's a glitch. They send out two checks. And then they contact the vendor and say, we sent you two checks. It's kind of like when, that, when the IRS sends you that refund that's got extra zeros that it shouldn't be there. You have to give it back when it's that kind of mistake. This is a whole nother order of mistake. And we think you ought to consider the possibility of amending the law that, in a way that takes into consideration what has occurred here and whether or not ultimately the tribes are liable for the repayment. It's your consideration. You will have to change the law if you decide to do that. Otherwise, we probably will go forward as a state towards uh, reclaiming that money. The tribes have uh, rights of appeal, both at the administrative level and the judicial level, and that could uh, entail a fairly complex and extended bit of litigation. And Mr. Chairman, with that, I will uh, uh, be happy, happy to answer questions now or later. I know you want to hear from the commissioner. And I, I would, if you just would stay there. And so, commissioner, if you want to come down and, and don't stay where you are, Mr. Nobles. Just, you're, you're, if you don't mind, she can sit in the middle oh, unless okay. she wants to be at the computer. So actually, why don't you negotiate who's sitting where? And then um, 
just so logistics, when the commissioner finishes, then we'll have Ms. Stevens come up. You all can be a little panel, and we'll uh, discuss this together. Welcome to the uh, committee, Commissioner. Nice to see you back. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Jody Harpstead. I serve as the Commissioner of the Department of Human Services. Thank you for the opportunity to address this report from the Office of the Legislative Auditor. I'd also like to thank Legislative Auditor Jim Nobles and his team for their work and professionalism in this special review of this issue. I would most especially today like to thank Chairman Jackson of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and Chairman Fairbanks of the White Earth Nation, who have been patient and gracious beyond expectation as I have met and consulted with them since I started 58 days ago. There's nothing more important for the Department of Human Services than to be trustworthy for the people of Minnesota, trustworthy for those who, who we support to live in community and trustworthy to the taxpayers whose resources were given to offer that support. The Legislative Auditor Report on Payments for Tribal Medication Assisted Treatment Programs concludes the department has created serious financial and legal problems for the state and the tribes which will be difficult to resolve. That is true and that was not trustworthy. The issues addressed in this report from the Legislative Auditor make one thing very clear. The Department of Human Services gave erroneous guidance to the White Earth Nation and the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, and thus department data over the past five years estimates it overpaid these tribal nations for medication-assisted treatment programs by over $29 million. An issue with this billing practice was not identified until earlier this year when the Red Lake Nation inquired about the same treatment program and Vern LaPlante, Tribal Relations Liaison and long-standing DHS employee, stopped the process to question the guidance. The guidance that was given to tribal governments was wrong, and it's impossible for us to serve Minnesotans in a trustworthy way if they believe that their interactions with DHS could leave them on the hook for tens of millions of dollars. I'm especially sorry that this error occurred in the department and unfairly affected the tribal nations with whom Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan are working to restore trust and rebuild our government to government relationships. Relationships important to the department, our <coughs> state, and recognized by Governor Walls's ex executive order 1924, noting our state's commitment to meaningful and timely consultation, coordination, and cooperation. Based on the OLA report, it, this is clearly not an error caused by one individual or one commissioner. I appreciate that might be frustrating to some who might be wanting to get to the bottom of this and take action against the culprit for all of us to feel that we have taken care of this. Instead, since the Wells Flanagan administration uncovered this error earlier this year, we have been setting to work to correct problems in the department's systems and processes that allowed such a costly error to take place and to ensure that we have protections in place for our partners in serving Minnesotans. The legislative auditor report also states that every well-managed organization designs and implements procedures to ensure that the organization complies with its legal obligations and internal policies. Organization call, organizations call these procedures internal controls. Amen. Couldn't agree more. I have heard a lot during my time at the department thus far about the importance of institutional memory, some of which we're losing as our baby boomer staff retires, and sharing that there's cohesion and consistency across administrations. What we have here with this system is an example of the dangers of institutional memory when decisions are accepted without review, challenge, or interrogation for years at a time. Operating a large, complex payment and billing system on the goodwill of seasoned managers with institutional memory and not on well-documented internal controls is a thing of the past in both the private and the public sector. We've had a stronger process in the multi-billion dollar processes of the department's healthcare payments, where flaws like the tribal MAT overpayments have not occurred, for the most part, in services that make up the vast majority of annual spending by the department, though they've not been immune from a few problems. The handling of other federal Medicaid programs and grants has been softer and less well-documented and disconnected from the federal expertise in our healthcare administration and needs to be strengthened. The really good news is that we have the very expertise we need to remedy the situation inside DHS under the leadership of Deputy Commissioner Chuck Johnson 
that has been applied to other processes in state government over the past three to four years. You will all remember when St. Peter Hospital and Anoka Regional Treatment Center were in the daily headlines four years ago. When I started this fall, I met a proud, cohesive senior team eager to show me their quality metrics and low incident rates after using state-of-the-art Six Sigma quality improvement processes to clean up their processes and procedures. Our Office of Continuous Improvement, filled with Six Sigma green belts and black belts led by Jeff Swanson, was dispatched to assist the Department of Health last year in shoring up the process to prevent elder abuse. Our Health and Human Services legislative leaders have all seen and admired our Office of Continuous Improvement's diagramming and redesign of the Inspector General's process for child care investigation this year, which was also featured in the Pioneer Press this past weekend. And so last week, I sent an email to our senior management team across the Department of Human Services to initiate Operation Swiss Watch as in humming with the precision, detail orientation, and flawless execution of a Swiss watch. Our Office of Continuous Improvement is recruiting subject matter experts and green and black belt process experts throughout the department to come together to get to the root cause of the tribal MAT overpayment issue and of each of the issues we've uncovered and disclosed in 2019. To map how decisions are made and by whom, and to propose a tighter, well-controlled, and documented process for moving forward that accomplishes the accountability the department needs to be trustworthy. We've imagined, for example, that when they complete that work, both our program administrations and our Medicaid director will have to sign off on all new program payment decisions before our finance division will disperse funds toward those payments, a triple-checked, permanently documented, accountable process that we can better track and control. In addition to these improvements, we need to ensure we're getting ahead of the curve, actively identifying and mitigating known risks before we find out about a problem through an overpayment or an audit. Our Chief Compliance Officer, Shireen Gandhi, and her team have developed a process that requires us to create plans to address known risks or areas of concern, such as brand new programs or brand new computer systems on an ongoing basis. We are rolling that plan out right now as well. This is another critical step in developing and maintaining a culture of compliance, internal controls, and continuous improvement. Another intention we have in the department is to fill our open assistant commissioner and other positions this quarter, giving extra weight to candidates with great management track records in large organizations. I look forward to building our team and our teamwork around a strong culture in the department as well as around Operation Swiss Watch. Returning to the Legislative Auditor's report, our responses to the report's three recommendations. Recommendation one, I've already described our proven approach to continuous process improvement that we'll now apply to our payment and rate setting processes. I have confidence that this approach will, over time, make those systems and our department stronger, more reliable, and more accountable every year going forward. Recommendation two, in regard to tribal payments for medication-assisted treatment, we believe the law is clear. Thinking that this report would be about tribal payments, we were surprised to see the emphasis on the non-tribal payments, which are not at all the same as the Federal Indian Health Service encounter rates, and have been central to Minnesota's approach to drug addiction treatment throughout the leadership of the past three gubernatorial administrations and seven past commissioners. We will look into that system of treatments and payments as well, but remain focused on solving the issues with the tribal nations. We have an agreement to contact CMS together with White Earth and Leech Lake to allow those tribal governments to hear confirmation from CMS along with us that the payment of the tribal encounter rate is not appropriate for these treatments. Next, we will follow our statutory duties to give official written notice to the tribes of the specific dollar amounts of any overpayments, starting a 30-day clock during which they have an opportunity to appeal having to repay the funds to DHS to an administrative law judge who can make a recommendation for resolution of payments. Recommendation three, the legislative auditor's report states, quote, the legislature should consider enacting exceptions to the law that require the Department of Human Services to recover payments to providers that resulted from department errors, unquote. 
Many others have said that it would be patently unfair to ask the tribal nations to repay funds they accepted on erroneous guidance from DHS, and that the state has more capacity for absorbing these funds throughout its long-term forecast than the tribes. We would be concerned if any solution harms services to other Minnesotans. We do have such a statute, by the way, on the Minnesota books in the case of cash assistance programs like general assistance and MFIP, wherein we are not allowed to recover funds if there's a department error, unless a reasonable person would have understood that they were being overpaid. I hope the legislature will consider this. I am as tired as all of you of reading about problems in the Department of Human Services. Though I'm also looking at each one of those problems as a trail marker, pointing to another process control step that will prevent future problems when put to rigorous examination. If there's another silver lining in this situation, it's the stories I heard in recent government to government consultation with our tribal nations as we were discussing this naughty problem. I asked, may I ask the question that's been on my mind all day, did these treatments work? Without hesitation, tribal leaders shared stories of pregnant women on treatment, these treatments, giving birth to healthier weight babies and the hope that that brings for their futures. I apologize to the White Earth Nation and Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe for the misinformation that has led to the current situation and I hope that the Minnesota legislature will work with us toward finding a solution. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner, and um, for those, those thoughtful comments. And day 58, is that where you're at? Um, so, Ms. Stevens, if you want to come down, um, and I'm getting a list together, so I have Benson Klein, and then I'm, a, I'm intending to alternate to side to side so people can have their fair chance, and we'll see when it makes sense to wind this down. Um, so, thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chairwoman, and Chairwoman Benson and Chairman Abler and committee members for the opportunity to speak to you all today. My name is Danny Stevens, and I work for the White Earth Nation as its Behavioral Health Assistant Director. I am a mother, my heart is sh shuddering with fear. I am a father, fighting to provide for my family. I am someone's child, attempting to overcome the odds, to define where I fit into your world. I am an employee, serving you your coffee, your lunch, your needs at the, de the department store. I am a student, staying up late and waking up early to prove that I can be more. I am Anishinaabe. I am not your statistic. Throughout this process, it has been brought to light that DHS is to blame for the overpayments to both White Earth and Leech Lake tribes. What hasn't been addressed is the lack of humanity that DHS is displaying. The only focus has been made is how the state wants the repayment, but the focus needs to be broader and encompass the potential modern day problems we face with our drug abuse experienced by our people. For instance, our mom's program that is nationally recognized has been detrimentally impacted because of their success of the program. Take homes have provided our people milestones within their recovery journey, allowing them to obtain employment, have regained and maintained custody of their children, have been involved in cultural ceremonies, and have been engaged in their communities and family. On October 29, 2019, the Office of Legislative Auditor released its findings from the investigation into medication-assisted treatment, overpayment issue involving the Minnesota Department of Human Services and the wider and Leech Lake Bands of Ojibwe. The OLA's investigation validated the statements from the two bands that they received direct guidance from DHS on how to structure their MAP billing. The overall findings from the OLA, as outlined in its report, were no surprise. We appreciate the work of Mr. Nobles and his staff to help shine light on this important topic in a timely and thorough manner. While the OLA investigation is complete, resolution of this matter remains in the distance. White Earth has been working with Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe and DHS to explore possible routes to resolve this issue. We expect DHS will eventually issue a formal request for repayment of funds as they did earlier this year, but we will work to exhaust all other options. We also expect DHS to fix a problem it created and look forward to future discussions with DHS on ways that can occur. Though White Earth is concerned about the anticipated request for repayment, 
we need to remember that there are real people who are affected by the decrease in funding our behavioral health department now faces. These people are pregnant women trying hard to make sure their baby has a healthy birth. They are coworkers who cannot take time off work to get their dose, so they risk, risk relapse by skipping it this time. They are our friends who use the last of their money to pay for a ride in the frigid winter time to get their dose at a clinic that is several miles from their home. They are our grandparents who want to show their grandchildren that sobriety is possible. We cannot let this be a setback and we will not regress. We need to stay solution oriented and continue to fight against addiction. We agree with the OLA's recommendations, including that the Minnesota legislators consider a revision to the law that would allow for exception to be made when an overpayment to a vendor is a result of guidance and approval from DHS. We are especially interested in resolving the question, why is payment allowed to a non-tribal treatment program when a client self-administers their medication at home, yet payment is not allowed to tribal treatment program for the same? We are optimistic that legislative fix can prevent this situation from reoccurring and provide fairness in how payments are administered to both tribal and non-tribal treatment programs. The OLA, the OLA findings support what the tribes have been saying all along, but now we need to face forward and keep working to minimize the negative effects which continue to be felt by our communities. We remain committed to a result that does not further harm our people. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I have a few thoughts, and then Senator Benson and Senator Klein and Kiff Meyer and Eaton. So, um, thank you all for coming. Um, we have had a good number of hearings in the last year and a half on the order of this, and um, everybody at this table has their own view of all this. But I just want to make mine, and I'll, I could exhaust the whole rest of time on my views, and I'm not going to do that. But I just have a few key thoughts to point out. Um, one is I'm a, a fan of the OLA. I think that they are amazing how they do their work. I'm a fan of uh, Commissioner Harpstead, and I'm so pleased that she's there, and I'm a fan of the tribes, helping them become independent, serving their, their uh, members in the best way possible, and the closest that can be to home, in my view, the better. And so with the, that as the preamble, um, uh, to the auditor, um, I just uh, would like to read from a, a document. Uh, it says, the state does not have a comprehensive system-wide strategy to guide its payment control efforts and DHS has not made controlling and proper payments a department-wide core value or goal. In addition, DHS has not completely assessed the amount or nature of improper payments incurring in Minnesota or systematically evaluated the effectiveness of existing or prospective payment controls. Uh, that was from August 2003. And um, talking about the Ventura administration, uh, with, to whom uh, Commissioner Goodnow responded in much in the same way that Commissioner Harpstead has to reply to this stuff that wasn't on her watch. And so, not news. And, and so, I just wanted to make sure people know this is not new. I had a good talk with you, uh, Mr. Nobles, and we, we have both failed in our missionary effort to succeed at helping this to happen. There's one thing else that I thought was really interesting. Every year, uh, the uh, finance commissioner at, at MMB writes a, a letter to the feds, and it's a, uh, it's a compliance report on federally assisted programs, and it says, uh, that was written in March of this year, signed by Mr. Franz, representing the OLA, uh, that all is well. And all is not well. And uh, this is available online. I was just really quite surprised to actually be aware of that. And it says that MMB is responsible for designing and applying statewide internal controls, and then state agencies are responsible for additional internal controls to provide reasonable assurance, and et cetera. Um, so, we all do the best we can. I think your budget is too small. And I'm not going beyond that to fault you. But this is an amazing task um, that we have ahead of us. The DHS budget has grown from 4.1 billion in 2002 to 19 billion in 2019. At that time, you were concerned that was a lot of money. It's a real lot of money now. And so um, we have our work cut out for us. So to DHS, um, to me, this is not just a matter of $29 million, which is a lot of money, or a 95% overpayment. Um, this is a matter of 
how do I trust the numbers for me personally, as a person that wants to serve 1.1 million people in the best possible way and leave nobody behind in their chance to succeed and enjoy the great life that Minnesota wants to make us available. And so, and I appreciate your Swiss watch uh, analogy, I love that, but I'm afraid there's some other Swiss going on and I think we have a department that's got like Swiss cheese. And the holes in there are remarkable and you've inherited that, Commissioner, and if you were any other, if, if you'd been there for three years, I'd have a whole different talk to you. I am cheering for your success. The report coming up after this is an example of the kind of work that we're going to be doing more of. And so if we can pour gas onto that. Um, but I, I have to comment that internally, when people speak up about some of these matters, they have been rebuffed. And we talked about Ms. Bernstein and how she raised her compliance concerns with this whole, you worry too much about compliance. I think with today's comments and 2003's report, we could use a little bit more of that and somehow you as a commissioner, and this is meant to be encouraging, um, I don't know if it is, but that's the goal, um, have to find a way to help people raise their head up and go like, no, that's not okay. That is not okay that we're doing this method or that method. And we are searching on the Blue Ribbon Commission on $100 million. Well, here's $28 million right here that should not have been spent and we have to dig in, uh, I'm ahead of myself. But so that's, um, People have to trust the department, and, and you're doing your best using the word trustworthy. Um, but I don't trust the math, and that's, a, and that's just on my mind, and so I'm not going to spend much more time on that. Um, and finally, to the tribes, uh, thank you for coming forward. I have talked to some of your leaders, and we're going to take a lot of this offline. I'm disappointed that whoever it was was uncomfortable with participating with Mr. Nobles. Let me encourage your leadership. Mr. Nobles is an honorable, ethical, fair-minded person. He's not trying to do anything bad, but we have to kind of know if we're sending money like that into your tribes, even though you're sovereign nations, and I'm happy the governor's re-upped that th theory, and I'm a big, big fan of sovereign nations and you serving. But we have to kind of rekindle the partnership, and I think going forward, maybe offline and maybe some hearings later, we can talk about how are the tribal human services programs going, and. And I, I think maybe something good can come out of all this. And finally, I don't know how on earth we're going to find $29 million to come out of your budgets. And personally, I think that's an untenable thing. So um, that was pretty short, right? So uh, thank you. And we'll be doing much more of this offline. If we have to do more of this in hearings to come, it's all about the clients. This is not about finding people to blame. It's about how do we make it better for tomorrow? Because in 2023, they're gonna, we'll be looking at this report, and in 2033, somebody else will be sitting here doing that. So, Senator Benson, thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. And first to Mr. Nobles, thank you for your work. I hope that as you are doing the single audit now, you have asked your auditors to increase their skepticism. Obviously, internal controls are much weaker than perceived or portrayed in the MMB letter. Um, Commissioner Harpstead, I know that you understand the importance of internal controls and are trying to you know, use a stick to push spaghetti noodles uphill is what it feels like every time we talk. Um, I'm glad that you are trying, but if there are people in the department who aren't getting on board, um, it needs to be clear that change is coming. Um, I talked with your compliance officer. I would encourage um, there to be more of a dotted line to her instead of everything having to go through managers. Um, it, you know, it, loop the managers in, but if there's a problem, get a dotted line um, to someone in compliance. Um, your internal auditors don't appear to have taken internal control seriously. And as much of a fan as I am of Lean Six Sigma, you can't get to everybody as fast as you're probably going to need to get to everybody. So I would say your internal auditors um, need to prioritize internal controls training for anybody with supervisor, manager, deputy, commissioner in their title. However, however they can best move that forward, they need to prioritize some, some basic training. I applaud. Um, Mr. LaPlante for saying, you know what, we need to check this. But it needs to become the culture of we need to check this and then signing off and, and being accountable for it and, and waiting 
for um, the black belts to get to everybody might take too long, but you do have some other resources that can do some basic internal controls, retraining um, as, we, as we wait. Um, I am deeply concerned that on page 14 of the report, we hear um, that the Behavioral Health Division has its own rate setting staff and there isn't much interaction. That's a cultural silo um, and needs to be resolved. There needs to be one person who's accountable for Medicaid performance. And if there isn't cooperation, again, we've talked over and over again, cultural change needs to happen. Um, there are many other things I could, I could go through. Um, on page 13 of the report, um, there's somebody there who's got to have budget authority and one of the, so we've got commissioner, deputy assistant, commissioner, director of behavioral health, deputy director of behavioral health, the treatment manager, the supervisor of clinical services policy team, all above Mr. Moldenhauer, somebody there has to have budget responsibility. In corporate world, we call it PNL, who, who has that responsibility and didn't check. That's a really serious question. Or maybe Mr. Moldenhauer had budget responsibility and wasn't tying things out. And so I don't know who, I, I know you have budget responsibility, but there's somebody below your rank that actually had responsibility for conforming to a budget. And we can't seem to figure out who that person was. And I think it's important, if they don't know it's their job, that that, that gets figured out. And, and at what level is their budget authority? Um, is it a supervisor? Is it managers? Is it deputy directors? I've been doing this a while, and I really think I should know that, but I don't. And so if there's a level that corresponds to budget responsibility, I, maybe Mr. Greenman or uh, Mr. Albrecht know, but I would like to have us have a general idea of what level of responsibility has budget authority. Um, my final concern is this amount, and as we look at page 19, at the very top, the Secretary of HHS determines the amount CMS may withhold from a state to recover over payments. Is this going to get tucked into some sort of forecast adjustment? Who do, do you know? want to answer? Uh, Commissioner? Commissioner Harpstead? Will this get tucked into a forecast adjustment? Commissioner. I'm hardly in a position after 58 days understanding the state budget right. <laughs> and, and how things flow. So I really am not quite sure how this gets accounted for going forward. Um, is, Senator Benson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Is Dave Greenman here? He didn't, he didn't join us. OK, we can follow up because it's been the habit, it seems, and somebody I'm sure will correct me, that if the feds say we're gonna make an adjustment, it gets tucked into the forecast, and the legislature has to find it. Um, there's $48 million that we were told that was included in an adjustment, and I can't find the number 48 anywhere in forecast adjustments from the, it was said that it was mentioned in a presentation, um, but again, I looked at those slides and I can't find that either, and, and I know. The department has documented all the places they thought they told us, but if you're going to tuck it in a forecast adjustment, I mean, to, the, to the folks around this table, do you know how hard we work to find $29 million for anything? And, and the department's just like, well, the feds are going to withhold it, and we're not really going to tell the legislature specifically, so let's just put it in a forecast adjustment so that if we have people coming off of our public programs because unemployment goes down and the economy improves, they have all this wiggle room to do adjustments. And I don't think this is the time to do that kind of adjustment. And so I'd appreciate you contemplating what that means, going back to your experts. Um, I will be following up with a letter of request later today. It was really triggered off the $48 million. It just happened to be ready um, in conjunction with this hearing. And so I would appreciate if forecast adjustments could become more transparent if they are um, amounts withheld or if they're administrative discretion. 
Um, again, Commissioner, you have the hardest job in Minnesota government right now. I am grateful that you have the improvement team starting to work through all the processes. I hope that builds institutional discipline and accountability. Um, I, I, I really don't have any other questions because I think we went through a lot of this. Um, a lot of it was gone through in the hearing yesterday, but I, I thank you for sitting there and telling the truth and um, trying to be as straightforward as you can with Minnesotans. I hope that it works its way down through the entire department. And thanks, and Commissioner, maybe uh, your staff could provide that $48 million thing to our CAs and it can get out. Uh, Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the presenters. Uh, specifically, thank you, Auditor Nobles. You know, I think the most telling thing about the report that you brought forward was this uh, accountability that you tried to pursue as you investigated, and you were ultimately only able to establish that someone at a very low level had authorized those payments, and, and people higher up either were not knowledgeable about them or not willing to take responsibility for them. Uh, and that seems to me the most important area where we need reform. Uh, I want to also thank the um, Walls administration and former Commissioner Lurie for finally sort of shining the light on this and blowing the whistle on this and sending out the letter on May 1 uh, that brought us all here. Uh, and uh, thank you to Commissioner Harpstead uh, for taking on this job and, and your emphasis on sort of management and reform and hiring people uh, who have management experience to bring this. And Mr. Chair, uh, your comments um, about empowering people within the department to uh, speak their voice when they see something that's inappropriate or not going right uh, and uh, changing the culture around that I think we're especially telling and I hope we can move forward with that. Um, you know, I think we're all bewildered uh, why anyone would receive an encounter, any practitioner would receive an encounter rate uh, for a home administered medication. If, if I took my blood pressure medicine this morning, why on earth would a physician be able to bill for that? And as, by way of explanation, if not excuse, uh, it may be worthy just to talk briefly about how um, the history of medication administered uh, opioid treatment has, has progressed. And you know, historically it was methadone uh, treatment. And it's quite important that methadone uh, is given in an observed setting in the clinic. And that actually is an encounter. And every uh, patient comes in every day and is observed taking their methadone uh, Monday through Thursday. And then typically for Friday through Sunday, they receive the three doses to take home. Uh, we can argue about whether those three home doses warrant an encounter charge as well. Uh, I would say that they do not. But in, in any event, that has been the practice, and quite appropriately so, to prevent diversion and abuse and resale uh, of methadone. Uh, with the newer product, Suboxone, generic is buprofenone, uh, that practice has gradually evolved away from observed treatment uh, because Suboxone has a lower potential for resale and abuse. Uh, the best practice currently is an initial clinic visit with some counseling and a plan and then a discharge with a prescription of Suboxone to self-administer at home. I would advance the theory uh, that we got to this place because old billing practices, which were appropriate, uh, did not evolve as clinical practice evolved. Uh, so it may not have been malice as much as delay um, in how we got to this spot. Uh, I would firmly support your suggestion uh, that we do no longer uh, charge and counter rates for any home administration of any medication. Uh, we need to find a better practice. Uh, and as we have discussed at the Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, this just touches on a, a very much larger problem with healthcare delivery in Minnesota and in America, which is that when you incentivize something, if you incentivize somebody uh, getting $450 for an encounter for anything, you are going to get a lot more of those encounters. Uh, and if you uh, reimburse people to fill hospital beds, you will have a lot more people in hospital beds and you'll have to build more hospitals. Uh, so it, as we move forward with how to effectively address the opioid crisis in Minnesota, it's important that our reimbursement strategies match the outcomes we want to achieve uh, and that we are reimbursed for healthy people who are off of opioids and not for habitual encounters. Uh, the darker side of that uh, is that there's very much the potential uh, that incentivizing to such an extent the treatment with buprofenine or Suboxone 
generated more people taking that medication. Uh, Medication-assisted treatment for opioid disorder is absolutely appropriate and very helpful for people who need it. It is not helpful at all and harmful uh, if it is used to excess or inappropriately. Uh, and I, as a practitioner, hope that did not occur. I suspect, knowing what I do about healthcare delivery, that it probably did and is an unseen harm uh, that may have occurred from this uh, billing practice. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chairman. And so, Mr. Nobles, I really appreciate your presentation. Probably when I hear Ms. Harpstead talk about trust, the one thing I think of with the Legislative Auditor's Office is trust. Uh, that we can read this document, we can go through this, and we can have trust. And that's extremely valuable. Uh, and trust that treating all parties fairly. Uh, so as I read through this document, no matter the entity, and I'm sorry that uh, the tribal members uh, did not cooperate with you in uh, participating in that because maybe they had some lack of trust, but I think it's uh, not deserved and I think they would have been better served um, had they um, seen that. So I want to thank you very much. And I think to Ms. Harpstead, I appreciate your good words. Uh, my biggest challenge, though, um, with this, though, is that we're looking for good results and a change of culture that is proven and demonstrated. And I think that's what's really important, because I think you can see with uh, Senator Abler going back to the 2003 report, where you can almost see the exact same words and accountability and all of that, and yet here we are uh, 16 years later and we're hearing the same words. So it's very difficult for us that we respect you and uh, wish you absolutely the very best in cooperating with you with a future session coming up and other things. But you can understand why we have to have a healthy bit of skepticism at dealing with that. And um, if it is real, we will see those results. And we look forward to hearing about those from you in tangible ways. Uh, that's really important. Um, I think also, I was going to go back to uh, some of the, um, the, the legal situations here at depending upon the um, advice of an agency, but the part of that, though, says if a reasonable person would have said, gee, that advice doesn't seem right. And in this case, I think Senator Klein actually touched on it a bit at realizing that a reasonable person would say there was no encounter, so how could we be paid this? I, so I would think that there would be difficulty in claiming uh, that kind of situation here because I think a reasonable person would have said they're taking the pill at home like any other pill they're taking, so why would this $455 or at the time $423 uh, be paid where there is no encounter? So I think that that reasonable person um, has a bit of uh, an issue here. I think it's more fundamentally uh, a little bit deeper than that. Um, I do think that when we take a look at this and, and reading the report, I have two questions, and one of them is for you, Ms. Harpstead, Commissioner Harpstead, and that is uh, you mentioned going back five years. That's $29 million. I'm not sure if payments were going on before those five years, because this seems to have a fairly deep history. And why are we only going back five years? You know, is there some um, statutory limitation there, which on occasion there is? And the other thing is that understanding uh, both in the report and in the Legislative Audit Commission yesterday uh, that the same kind of payment is going on for non-tribal. I think if you have the authority to stop the tribals, then why don't you have the authority to stop the non-tribal? And matter of fact, you know, the, my question is what else is there? What other kinds of encounter payments are going on that may be using the same kind of thinking? What else is going on that we just still don't know about yet? And I think one of the challenges for you, Commissioner Harpstead, is to answer that question. Um, I think we need to have that answer. I think that's going to be very, very important. And then uh, my other question is in regards to uh, going back again about the five years, uh, but also uh, responding back to if you have justification to stop the payments in regards to the tribal, 
why not all of those other ones that are non-tribal? If you could respond to those two things. And actually, Senator Kiffmeyer, we're going to run out of time if we have all those lengthy kind oh, maybe of answers. We could but I just think that. But I mean, so I think what we're teeing up here, what I, given the agenda and what we're doing today, is teeing up a whole bunch of questions. And okay. I think Senator Benson's not here, but I think an entire hearing on encounter rates would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. What are we getting for our money? And a bunch of places get them. And I understand there's seven different encounter rates that. Uh, at least in one program that you can get. And if you can get one in all, all seven, but if you want to just have a short comment and then I just, we need to honor the rest of the members. Mr. Senator. Chair, absolutely. And uh, Ms. Harpstead, I think sometimes you put these questions on the table, perfectly appropriate if you want to respond, whatever the Mr. Chair um, uh, is doing here today, but you can also in the further or send out an email to all of us would be fine too. Mr. Harpstead, uh, highlight the answer or whatever. Go ahead and say whatever you like. I, I think it would be, easier to document that and send it back out to you. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> and there's a difference between the um, uh, uh, Indian Health Service encounter rate and the rates that we're paying non-tribal. They're not apples and apples payments. So I, I think it would be better if I could document that and send it back to you. Okay, thank you so very thank much, you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, my first question um, is, um, for uh, the uh, legislative auditor, uh, who I want to thank you, Mr. Nobles, for your hard work on this. It's a remarkable report. Um, my question is, is that, is there any um, uh, investigation into fraud for employees or former employees of the tribes at all? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Eaton. Uh, when we first uh, decided to conduct our review, uh, that is obviously something that we had to consider. It's something that auditors are required to consider. Was there any fraud on either side that could have uh, been involved? Um, we do not have clear authority uh, to go into the tribes and audit uh, their books. Uh, we cannot to the best of my understanding, uh, compel uh, a member of a tribe to cooperate with us as we can a state employee because of their status as a sovereign nation. We could have tested that. I decided that um, it would probably result in a protracted legal uh, uh, proceeding as to whether or not we have that jurisdiction. So. I sent letters uh, to both tribal chairs asking them to um, allow us to come and interview, uh, have a discussion with them and others on their staff and to be able to have access to documents. Uh, they, for whatever reason, did not respond to that. And uh, I, I, I guess I will say I, I understand to some degree. Uh, they don't know, really know who we are. Maybe I think they better understand now. Uh, about our independence. I think it may have been represented to them that we, in fact, were working with DHS. They may have also uh, considered a variety of other reasons why they didn't want to have us there. So as an alternative, uh, we met with federal officials who do have clear jurisdiction. Uh, we met with the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, with the uh, Department of Human Services, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General, and with the FBI. So. That is really in their hands to investigate if they choose to investigate um, any concerns about the use of this money. Um, it's my understanding that the tribes uh, will uh, face some questions about how the money was actually used. Uh, it is a lot of money, and the federal government is paying it through the state for a certain specific categorical programmatic purpose and the federal government will want some assurance that it was spent for those purposes. That will be up to them to make those inquiries. Senator Eaton. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Nobles. My concern is that there's kind of this cloud hanging over this public statement that they're being investigated for fraud, and um, I'm not comfortable with that, but uh, Mr. I understand Chair, maybe, your position. Let, let me just clarify. Mr. Nobles. I do not know. I mean, the, the federal government has that jurisdiction. Whether they have chosen to exercise it, I don't know. So let me be clear. 
I do not know and am not saying that there is a federal fraud investigation relative to the tribes. All I'm telling you is that we don't have that jurisdiction. Federal authorities would. And uh, so let me just be clear. I am not saying there is any fraud investigation currently ongoing uh, by federal officials of either tribe. I'm saying I don't know. Okay, Ms. You. Stevens, you would like to comment on that? Yes, uh, okay. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Chair, uh, Senator Eaton, in regards to the cooperation, we did cooperate throughout this whole process with DHS, um, going through the data, compiling the data, although we know that was exhausted because there's so many claims to go through just with that data dump alone. Um, in regards to Mr. Nobles and his letter, I do know personally that a letter was sent, but I'm not prepared to state why or why not there was a response, but just wanted to put out there that there was cooperation and we were looking forward to the audit um, from the OA, OLA going forward. And Senator Eaton, just to help pile on what, where you're going, I think, as I read the report, I don't see any hint of fraud. I see a hint of a poor process and a misunderstanding about what you can do. And I see a hint of a, of a tribe that actually, tribes that actually believed the letters they got from DHS. So Senator Eaton. I would agree with you, Mr. Chair. My point was that I don't believe there is fraud, but I think there is in a public record stated that there's an investigation of it, and I'm not comfortable with that cloud hanging over the tribes. But um, my other question is, um, I guess for the commissioner, um, I would like to know what the role um, the Assistant Commissioner Chuck Johnson had during the time that all this inappropriate payment was going on, if he's the person who's going to be cleaning this up. Ms. Harpstead. Um, he's been our Deputy Commissioner for many years now, of course. He has the control functions in his shop, so he has our compliance department and um, the Office of Continuous Improvement and our Finance Division. and. Um, as you have heard, the decisions on this were dispersed throughout the department and not centralized in one place. We've come to the conclusion now that we do need to centralize more of our control processes in one place under Chuck Johnson. And um, we've come to the conclusion that we need to take this tool that we've had for some years now uh, in terms of continuous process improvement, Six Sigma process control, and apply it to our payment systems. Thank you. Senator Eaton. I would just like to add that um, to this thing that I think what this shows is that our um, reimbursement rate for treatment is grossly underfunded and that when the tribes were given this amount of money, things started to change and improve on the reservations and now we're finding out that it was an overpayment but really what it was was <coughs> adequate and now they've been cut about 70% and these programs are gonna flounder. So I'm hoping that we can find a way to continue to bring funds to this um, uh, serious public health issue where the, um, the deaths on the reservations from overdose are just uh, astounding. And um, this is a crisis and we need to continue to work on it. I'm not. I know the money's a lot and that we need to do something about it as far as what was underfund or overpaid, but um, really what it did is, is uh, provide the funding for something that was underfunded in the first place. Thank you. Thanks, and you know, just Commissioner, I just, I appreciate how you're trying to spread the responsibility throughout the department, but it sounds to me like one well-intended guy told another, another well-intended guy something and nobody's watching. And um, I don't know how we get away from that. So I have three more questioners and I think we're gonna have to wrap this section up. Ralph Hayden and Hoffman. So Senator Ralph. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and as usual, like mine, sometimes tend to focus on the same things. So I think much of what I would, would have asked, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer has at least st uh, alluded to. I am concerned about the fact that we have these other payments going to non-tribal entities, whatever they are. And I'm concerned while we're saying, well, it's small payments, and but there doesn't seem to be much talk about exactly what is involved in those payments. What kind of programs? Are they all for uh, drug treatment programs? Or are there encounter payments being made for other types of programs? 
programs. I'm concerned that this might be the tip of the iceberg that we need to really look at to make sure that there's not something something more going on out there and we can say $20 here, $20 there, but you multiply times 100,000 payments and suddenly you're looking at real money. So that, that is my basic concern. Uh, and I would certainly hope that we would get a more detailed look at that and that I assume that if that shows that we may need to inquire further that the fine office or the office of legislative audit would be would be in a position to be able to look into that. Uh, so that, that, I am, that is my concern that we learn from what has happened here. Obviously there were payments that were made that were just not controlled and 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 we've we've heard this internal controls i applaud you uh ms harstead for going forward on your own without any further uh legislative uh impetus uh for trying to institute programs that will bring these concerns to the forefront and uh so with that i uh, that's all I'll, I'll take that as a comment thank you uh, senator hayden well <laughs> I know it's exciting. Carter, that's a crisp. <laughs> oh, so good recovery. To, we'll clean that up. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Nobles and Commissioner and our tribal members for being here. Um, it, it is, um, you know, this is kind of a tough conversation to continue to have. We have now started to have regular meetings to talk about uh, systemic issues inside of the department. Um, and then our resident historian, Chair Abler, has uh, gone into the archives and showed us that this is not a new conversation. Um, so I um, am troubled, obviously, by the continued problems that we're having inside of the department, um, though I will say that I feel like, uh, Commissioner, your forthright and candor about admitting that there is a problem and talking about things like uh, we usually talk about institutional uh, memory uh, as something that we always have to have and instead the way that we've done it is really important and so when we visited and here in your testimony I think you started to kind of raise up that the issue of uh, institutional knowledge though it could be helpful it also can be harmful um, and the ability for us to go in and really take a look at why we're doing the things that we've done, how come, and is it appropriate for today, uh, I can certainly appreciate it. I feel like I've been having this conversation a lot where we do things over and over and over again, and nobody knows why because that's the way that we've done them. Um, I am very encouraged. Um, I had a conversation with your team, Mr. Swanson and others, and the continuous improvement. And so I think it's worthy to say that I think that they're making a lot of improvements, for instance, in the OIG uh, area that Mr. Nobles, you uh, talked about. I was, um, though there's a long ways yet to go, uh, but it sounds like that they've gotten to the bottom of uh, what the problem is and are now starting to develop uh, a program and processes to improve them. For instance, uh, there wasn't any clear rhyme or reason of who we investigated, why we investigated them, and how much energy we were going to spend. Uh, should it just be a simple overpayment or, or an administrative fix, or is it actually a criminal intent? That's something that they're starting to fix that we didn't have uh, in that process. Uh, before then when uh, Mr. Nobles and, and this committee kind of wrestled with that. So it appears to me that we're on the right track, that we have some of the tools in place uh, internally. I guess the question or maybe what I, what I want to ask is if, if we've identified this, for instance, in the OIG department and now we're identifying this in the substance abuse area, uh, I think the committee is saying that, like, where else could there be an issue? And do you have enough Mr. Swansons, if you will, to be able to get that done in a reasonable amount of time to turn the organism or to make sure that, I don't want to be careful here, I know there's good people who do this work, but that we're doing the verification uh, to make sure that things are getting done the way that it should. And frankly, uh, 
um, we're taking up a lot of the legislative auditor's time in DHS, and there's a whole bunch of things in state government that I know that he has. Kim, I don't think Mr. Nobles has the time to just spend all his time embedded inside of DHS. So let me just ask the question, because I think that was more of a statement than I had another statement after that. Commissioner uh, and Mr. Nobles, you can either or can answer or both. How, how do we know, or what, what's the plan to ensure that we're going to be able to get through all of the various departments and divisions inside of DHS to ensure that these things aren't happening throughout the system? Commissioner. Mr. and Madam Chair and Senator, um, we, as you know, have also dug up and reported on several other issues we've discovered in the department in the, over the summer and, and in this uh, fall time. And as we analyze those, we're beginning to see common points where we need to make a difference. As I mentioned, um, as Mr. Swanson and team do their process improvement work, um, we would expect, for example, uh, going forward, that a person most closely related to a particular payment would make a decision about it and sign off. Our Medicaid director would make another decision and sign off, and our finance division wouldn't begin to issue checks until they had all the other sign-offs. So we're talking about three points of, of, sign, of signature at least, and we let, need to let the, Mr. Swanson and his team do their work to tell us if that is the process or if there's more to it. Um, we've already begun to see how that may have made a difference in every one of the other things that we've talked about this summer. And so uh, I think that what we're seeing is boiling this down to the issue of applying these continuous process improvement systems to our payment systems so that there are proper sign-offs when there's a new procedure and everyone agrees that it's the right way to go before we start issuing checks. That alone would have solved many of the problems we've discussed this summer. And we'll just need to continue to strengthen that uh, over time. Senator Hayden. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I imagine Auditor Nodals is going to be watching this clearly. The other thing that I think that Senator Eaton kind of brought up was, um, you know, per the regs, per the encounter data, all of the problems that we have. But if you listen to to the people who do the work, if you listen to the to the tribal representatives here. Uh, I happen to represent the largest urban uh, Indian kind of housing development and in, in kind of concentration of, of native folks uh, in, in the Little Earth in that area uh, of my district that surrounds it, and I've kind of met with them. The money, though, if it shouldn't have been given because of the encounter data was billed wrong, it appears, unless something else somebody else has you know, some other information, that the money was still being used on people uh, who are suffering from substance abuse and all the things that come with that. Where do they live? What do they eat? You know, what is the trauma that they have in their life, mental health services, et cetera. So I think that there is also a bigger issue as we get down to whatever the rate should have been, that there still is dollars that are needed in those communities uh, to be able to help support the people who uh, have this, this, this issue, if you will. So I, I, I won't ask the question. I think it's a bigger statement to say we're going to kind of figure out the technical aspect of this and the legal ramifications and who pays what and where. But what I think we should really be thinking about in addition to that as we kind of bat down the hatches and ensure that the money uh, is being, is being uh, billed appropriately, the bigger question is what is the cost to support people with substance use disorder? What is the dollars that we need to support their families and their children uh, in order for them to deal with those issues and to live a more productive life. Uh, what what should we be doing and what is that number? So there's kind of two things going here and I just think simply resolving the issue of what rate we should be charging doesn't solve the issue of how many how much money we should be spending or how many resources we should be allocating to support a disease that we know has been exacerbated by the pharmaceutical companies 
uh, suggesting that somehow this medication was not addictive. I think that that's the bigger issue that we have to solve, and I don't know if that reduces uh, the amount of money that we spend, but just find a different way in which to bill or to allocate resources to those communities. So um, I, I think, Commissioner, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on what that, because I don't want us to get so down the rabbit hole that we forget what we were trying to do. So Senator Hayden, I'll maybe I'll give the same advice I offered Senator Kiffmeyer, who asked almost the same kind of a question, that that's, we're running out of time, and that's, that question, to answer it properly, is a long answer. And we can actually have a meeting about that and talk about substance abuse and look at what we've done in the 245G business and what are we spending and what does it take? And I know Senator Klein has a strong interest in that area as well, and many others do. So if that's all right. Yeah, so, so Mr. Chair, I guess what I want to make sure is, um, and, and you know, with all due respect, we're in the interim. Um, and so what happens is I thought that we use this time to really dig deep and answer those questions. I can have those conversations with the commissioner and she comes to my office like yours, but for the purpose of the committee, I don't know if we wanna do a retreat or a workshop, but or and much less the people who are watching, I, I respect the amount of time that we've allocated. However, in the interim, when we're taking a deeper dive on these issues, and we only have so many people that are on the Blue Ribbon Task Force and all these kind of things, so we're here. So I do hope that in the future, and I want to respect uh, the time you've allocated for all the work we have to do, but I do hope that in the future, in the interim, that we can actually have these conversations so that we can really understand the bigger issue that we're having here. Otherwise, I feel like we're just simply in session, running on a tight window, and only get a certain amount of questions okay. and answers. Well, Senator Hayden, I think what you're suggesting is maybe if we had a little had a work group of some sort, not in this kind of context, and actually dug in on some of this, it could be really interesting, some kind of substance abuse thing. We talked about the tribes. I've talked about doing some more work there, and maybe they would come and chat about that on a, on a scheduled basis, and let's talk about that offline. Okay. So I have Senator Hoffman and Senator Drehan promised he'd be really short. So. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Madam Chair, and, and thank you, um, Mr. Noble, and, and thank you, uh, new Commissioner Harvestead, for, for coming here today. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I think th this conversation, it's, it's worthy of getting a little deeper because I have tons of questions regarding the OLA report and comments that are germane to this type of setting. Rather than having a work group, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, I think we should extend our time and really have some in-depth conversations because once again, we are feeling the anxiety of hurry up and get something in front and then we don't do anything about it afterwards. So I'd like to see some follow-up if that would be okay. And I will hold my comments to you then, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Madam Chair. Um, first of all, uh, the, the OLA report was really clear. Thank you, Mr. Noble. I, I really enjoy reading your reports from the standpoint of it. It enlightens about how systems could or should be working and what isn't working in systems. And we know, for example, in Minnesota, 75% of all of our federal dollars that come to the state of Minnesota come to the state in the form of Medicaid. 75% of that is supposed to be used for people with disabilities and our elderly, right? And so we know there's a, a, a large group of how that money's supposed to be spent and how they do it. And to hear your comment about how there's no formal policy on how DHS program divisions must interact with the healthcare administration shows that dysfunction that you talked about. And, and, and I would hope that um, highlighting that, that we get to that. Your ideal chart that you sent out, you can have all, uh, um, Madam Commissioner, the, the Six Sigma black belts you want, but unless you paradigm that, that ideal chart to really talk about the culture of DHS, because what this report has done is just validated some things that have come in front of my desk regarding the culture at DHS and how we treat people with disabilities, how we treat people right within that own division. I'm not gonna bring that up now, but that's something that I do wanna talk to you about, and I think it's worthy that this group really dig a little deeper in how that. So, what I want to say to you, Madam Commissioner, is that you know we as elected officials are standing ready to help you get through whatever you need to get because your success um, is success for 1.1 million people that count on that 75% of federal dollars, right, Medicaid. The other thing, though, that's important to look at is that when 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 you don't have a policy that dictates how the management decisions are made, 
few years from now, you're gone. Every we're gone. There's new, and if there's no system in place, and your Six Sigma black belts are out the door with the rest of them, you still don't have a, an active decision-making process, right? You have it that's internal, but does that become culture? That's more of a question than anything else. I don't think it's our decision here to talk about that. That's really that. Thing, but I do think the OLL's report about a policy, a state uh, statute on that is, is worthy of that investigation. And two other things uh, is the Minnesota Official Records Act. I think we need to dig a little deeper in there about how that violation occurred, why it occurred, and what we need to do to make sure that those things aren't happening. And again, Mr. Noble pointed that out. And, and there's still the question of who's responsible, right? Well, I don't care anymore about who's the responsibility. The fact is it happened. We are taking full accountability on that. Let's not harm those people that Senator uh, Abler, that Senator Hayden and Senator Eaton just talked about because when you're in recovery, you need all the support you can get. And, and I do not want to see us harm the folks that were doing what they thought was due diligence in, in, in their control on recovery. And so um, that's, again, something that we should keep keep having the discussion on. I have some other ones. Again, I just want to say we stand to assist you, Commissioner, but um, you know, as uh, Jim Noble said, you know, you can't audit your way to, to good governance. And, and I said in the last hearing, you can't sue your way, but I'm tired of reading about the settlements that all of a sudden have become in front of my desk and in front of Senator Abler's desk about what happened because of a lawsuit about how somebody was treated. Those things got to stop, and, and we're here to help you stop that. So thank you, and, and I'll hold the rest of my comments two pages here, Senator Abler. Well, thanks, Senator Hoffman. And actually to Senator Hayden and Hoffman and Topics, um, I would be, I would appreciate members' input about what we should do in the interim time. I would like to do something in December and something in January. Um, I think maybe a substance abuse hearing uh, could, could make sense for December. And, and I'm concerned about, there's actually a lot of things that bubble up about accommodations for persons with disabilities at departments, and the city of St. Paul had a little, like, some issues, I understand, and indeed, and other departments have found a struggle to properly incorporate individuals who are really going to make their departments more successful. And I, I plan, was planning to talk about that maybe in January. But um, Senator Graham, you get the last question or comment. Thank you, Chair. And, and thank you uh, for coming, uh, everyone. Um, I guess to, uh, to respond to a question earlier about how much the programs cost, the way it looks on page eight, it's about 51000 a year per person if I did the math correctly. Um, and, and my question would be, was that the full year of 19? Because this came up in, in May. It would be. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nobles. Okay. Perfect, thank you. And then I won't, I won't, I have other questions on that, but I'll take them offline, Chair. Okay. And then one more, um, I, I guess, question. You, uh, uh, Mr. Nobles, you, uh, um, talked about the lack of documentation at DHS. Is there any conflict with the legal requirements or federal reimbursement that we get or the pass-through that you encountered in your investigation? Mr. Nobles. Uh, I'm not quite sure, uh, does the, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, that, that they did not comply with federal requirements on documentation? Correct, yeah. Uh, or state requirements, I mean, either or. Absolutely, uh, Mr. Chairman, members, there is, as was referenced, uh, there is an Official Records Act, and I have it here, I won't quote from it, but I have it kind of in my head, and that is, it's a responsibility of people in state government to record uh, what they are doing, why they're doing it, the justification for it, the legal authority for it. We have an Official Records Act, and it was not followed in this case. So, and there are a lot of implications from not following that. Some of what you see here, the department doesn't know who made this decision. We couldn't find that. There's no trail. So that's one of the reasons that you have an Official Records Act, that requirement that you document uh, your, not only financial activities, but your policy decisions, the rationale. And then as the commissioner said, in a well-functioning organization, that moves up the chain for review and approval. Are we all on board with that? Has it been checked by the compliance officer? Has it been checked by internal audit? Has it been checked by the legal counsel? So there are all kinds of things that need to happen in organizations that may start at the bottom, but they really need to go through this chain of review and approval. And that's why we have an Official Records Act. It wasn't followed in this case. 
Thank is you. That, oh, that's okay. Thanks. Um, Ms. Stevens, do you want to say a last word from yeah. this? I just have something. one more comment, uh, Mr. Please. Chair, Mr. Chair, Senator. Um, in regards to the chart that you referenced in the OLA report, um, the $51,000 per client, um, I just wanted to comment saying um, there are over-income clients also in our programming because our programs are so successful that we eat that cost too. So I just want everyone to consider that when that's a topic. And to the bigger picture, do you want to offer any just uh, goodbye comment or is that... Fine. I just want to be Yeah, to I want to thank everybody for having me here and representing our tribes. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Nobles, do you want to offer a final thought? Just to thank you, Mr. Chairman, right. and all of you, and we'll certainly be back with you anytime you uh, want us to be here. Commissioner, do you want to say Just anything? thank you, all of you, for your uh, offers of support and encouragement and for your oversight of the department. And we fully intend to have this department become the trustworthy department you need to depend on. Thank, thank you. you very much. So with that, uh, we'll move on. Thank you very much, all of you. And now, Mr. Swanson, if you want to come up here. And so uh, this was time very well spent, and I think we put as much reasonable time as we can. That just means that um, we're going to hear more of the highlight reel from Mr. Swanson and, uh, and on, on the other uh, folks as well. There's ample time to get through the touching base about that. So. Are you staying? Yeah, please. You can stay as long as you like. You can stay all day. We should have brought coffee. So, Mr. This is going to be mostly, I just think, a report. It's not to be one sided coming from you, Mr. Swanson. And so, if you could just arrange your time to fit into a 15 minute presentation, and then we'll say thank you and tell you to leave. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Between the two of you, so uh, Commissioner, if you want to tee it up a little bit or whichever, yeah, so. I, I would. I would like this to is, meet. I mean, this is worth an hour or more. We can even go into it more later, but I just—it's something okay. to celebrate how good something works. Yeah. So, yeah, get your props up there and go ahead, Mr. Yep. Swanson. I'd like you to meet Jeff Swanson our, from our Office of Continuous Improvement, and, and uh, you've heard of his name many times already today and before this, um, and his. Um, Presentation of what he does requires some audiovisual aids and some setups, so that's what's going on here. Uh, I just also want to thank uh, the, ch the chairs today for inviting Mr. Swanson to come to present the work that our team did, his team did, in our child care uh, fraud investigations, and especially timely to discuss this um, as we apply the same kinds of uh, same kinds of things to our payment processes. And uh, you'll also see that the process for CCAP improvement that Mr. Swanson describes directly addresses OLA findings from last year's CCAP reports. So this is what we do with the results of the reports that, like you were looking at this morning. Mr. Swanson. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Swanson, welcome to the committee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair Abler and Madam Chair Benson and Senator uh, Hayden, I would just like to thank you for the time that you spent with the DHS team over the last couple of months when we came in and explained all the good work we did, how seriously we took uh, the OLA report uh, that was specifically tied to CCAP, and uh, we really heard the frustration you guys went through last year, our agency did, and I think it's exciting news of how things get better. I also am going to change my um, briefing a little bit uh, because it pertains to some of the stuff you guys just went over where I think we can really add some value moving forward. Uh, I would also just make sure you guys have handouts in front of you. You should have a handout for the legacy process on my right. You should have a handout for the new process on my left. And then you should also have the legislative, the OLA uh, crosswalk for the OLA report that was generated by uh, Mr. Nobles and his team about CCAP and how we address those issues. I also, unfortunately, have to, have to get a little nerdy with you guys and talk a little bit about the definitions of Lean Six Sigma. I promise to be brief. Uh, the methodology that we use at the Office of Continuous Improvement for DHS is Lean Six Sigma. And let me give you the definition because I think it really pertains to the discussion you had earlier. It is a fact-based, data-driven, philosophy of improvement that values defect prevention over defect detection. So the purpose is to solve issues before they become issues, right, in that regard. It drives customer satisfaction and bottom line results by reducing variations, waste, cycle time, while promoting the use of work standardization and workflow. 
We are a data-driven shop. Uh, we have the adage, if you cannot measure it, you probably can't manage it. Uh, so that is a focus that we use. Some of the senators have brought up um, comments about the CI team will come in or uh, fix it. We, we're not magicians. Uh, we are people that are trained in a methodology. We work with the business areas to collaborate with them. So this is not us uh, interjecting a process on them. This has to be something they own and they truly uh, want to be part of their business process moving forward. And we are excited about those opportunities in the future as well. Let's talk a little bit about the CCAP project because I think there's some th lessons learned that we sure have about that moving in to the commissioner's new Swiss watch project, which we like. Uh, and one of them is it's a collaborative effort that has brought about uh, the CI office will work with the team. In this case, we worked with the inspector general's uh, Office of Inspector General's Licensing, CCAP Investigations Unit, OIG Data, OIG Legal, CCAP Policy, and we took a combination from those groups and we took uh, formal and informal leaders from those areas and subject matters experts from different areas within there as well. So we, we are very specific on a chemistry of the team that we bring together for that. I want to really give a, a special uh, recognition to Minute Agile Apps development team who really assisted <laughs> us. They were great business partners and we couldn't have uh, pulled this off without their help. So a special thanks to Minute as well. Let me give you another background about the project itself. It started in January two, 2019. We went into a uh, phased rollout on July 25th of this year where we put the new process standards and protocols and tools into place. It's fair to say that even after July 25th, in some of the areas that I go over on these uh, uh, handouts and this storyboard will uh, tie it together, even after 25th, we have been continually improving and modernizing and bringing up to speed this process. We target processes, not people and personalities. We are hard on processes. I couldn't help but listen to this past hour and a half talk about institutional knowledge. Dr. Deming, the father of continuous improvement, to paraphrase a sta statement he had, experience only matters if you're doing it right. So we really rely on the process itself. The process has to be strong and sustainable for the prevention of defects and errors moving forward. This process improvement cycle that we've talked about today and what we're going to be using in the future does not come without a lot of energy being needed to uh, move, the, move the mountain in some cases. Um, we do sometimes, a lot of times, have positive conflict that comes into play. We have, um, we, we generate deliverables, we generate um, change, and that can be very stressful as we all know. Let me give you a, f a few examples of some areas that we worked on in this project. Uh, data, operational and strategic, so data day, uh, data for management to use to regulate work, as well as strategic data that can be rolled up through the commissioner's office, governor's office, and to the legislature as well. We worked on standards, transparencies, transparency to the process. We know there can't be transparency as specific investigations are going on, but management the legislature should have transparency to the process that is going on in place. Protocols, documentation, centralized repository of information, elimination of existing backlogs. Change is hard, substantial and sustainable, sustainable change is even harder. Think of this as a cruiser, uh, a, a, a luxury cruiser or a, for somebody taking a cruise and they go out. It's very hard to nudge that, right, to change the direction of that cruise ship. So we find it so difficult and that's why we have to really leverage the methodology and work with the business areas to put that uh, changes in place and to make those nudges and in some cases turns of that ship. Using the ship analogy, and I believe the article this weekend the paper did as well, is there's such a thing as bureaucratic particles. In my 30 years at the Department of Human Services, uh, there are bureaucratic barnacles. They are just things that attach themselves to the process. Just like boats have barnacles, bureaucracy has barnacles. They're neither good or bad. When you have a few of them, they're just a nuisance. When you have a lot of them, they provide drag on the process and the program. 
in this case with, with CCAP, we had a lot of them, and they did provide uh, drag on the process itself and the program. I'm, I'm thankful to say, and I'm proud to say, with the help of the leadership at DHS, we were able to remove those barnacles, and we're in the process now of moving forward uh, with a process and a um, culture in OIG that represents the understanding that data is critical to our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, just to let you know personally, it was painful last year to listen to you guys ask the questions and us trying to give answers. It motivated the CI team, it motivated OIG. We have hardworking people in those areas that really want to turn this around, and they're doing it. So thank you so much. I feel like I want to really get to the, I know times and issues, so I want to get moving for you guys, so. Well, that, but I, thank you, Mr. Swanson. I think the picture's worth a thousand words. You've got the Rubik's, you got the, um, what was that guy, uh, Rube Goldberg yeah. uh, <laughs> design over here yeah. and with notebooks and just random and then yeah. actually a streamlined system that actually might yeah. work. But Mr. Chair, I just want to point out, this doesn't happen on purpose. Nobody, nobody decided to design this, right? It's not rational. <clears throat> so what happens is this happens because barnacles are attached as this goes through. This was probably <clears throat> years ago a much simpler process that just constantly was absorbing barnacles that just slowed it down, dragged it. So think of it as a ship. What you see there is a yeah. ship that has barnacles. We take it out, we power wash it. That's kind of a dirty job to power wash barnacles off. And then we uh, come up with a new process. Now this was not without energy and some frustration from uh, a lot of probably parties. a lot of frustration. A lot of a lot, sometimes a lot of frustration, uh, but this is a new <clears> process. <throat> and if I could just highlight a couple Please. things, I just want to thank you. Very seldom do we. Why don't you highlight the new process, like how it's actually going to work? That would be productive. In the sure, yeah. sure. Let's let's go through that at this point. Um, sorry, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, if you see up in the upper left hand of your handout. You have the ability now for information to come into a triage unit that is specifically tied to the early and often program that you guys uh, enhanced the funding for this last session that made it possible for us to then design a new process while you made other changes also to some of the tools that licensing and uh, CCAP investigators have. So that was critical. We really had a golden opportunity here and with those changes you made last year in legislation we were able to incorporate that as we designed a new process. So it goes into information triage. You notice case management database, Agile Apps. Every step of this way, we're gonna have data. What came in, what went out, who took action, when they took action, what action did they take? So accountability to the process and the organization. You see a first assessment team, uh, just to give you uh, a sense on that, this is what they would decide on what should we do, when can we do it, what can we do. So for example, it could be warning letters, it could be administrative sanctions, overpayments, or assigned to the CCAP investigator. I think the main thing I want to point out in this as well is that we're making decisions earlier in the process, not later. So the pay and chase piece of when, in, when money goes out and then we somehow have to recover portions of that, I think it shows we don't really have a great track record on the amount that we recover. So what we try to do is avoid it as much as possible to shut the water off, yeah. per se, early in the process. Then it goes through an area where it's signed to CCAP investigators. Uh, in some case, they're doing compliance monitoring uh, tied to the early and often program. In other cases, they're doing specific investigations. Then it goes to a second assessment where then we uh, make a decision, does this bring to the level of uh, dispatching to the BCA or to other uh, organizations within the state? So I'm trying to be conscious of time. No, so I'm it's, you're, you're doing great. Yeah. And, and um, the one question, but it's maybe sure. Senator Kiffmeyer going into your session. This is, I know you're familiar with the Six Sigma business, but this is, I can't think that every part of government shouldn't have this done. So I mean, I, in your committee, you might want to have a hearing and talk about this at some more length. We may bring you back to talk more about the OIG okay. thing as it unfolds. And, and I just wanted to offer one more comment. And I ran into Jerry Kerber yesterday in the hallway as we were talking about chronic wasting disease and the other committee about how that's a, just, Jerry Kerber was, uh, he's alive and well. Yep. Um, <laughs> and uh, happily enjoying retirement. And, but he, it's an example Mr. Swanson, where somebody actually knew how this all worked and through his, it, 
And it, it actually kind of worked because he sort of, I wonder how many of those things I helped to pass to mess up your system. But, no comment. Yeah. <laughs> it'd be nice to put names in all those. So. But, I, but I don't know that how Miss Ham could ever have succeeded in that, given all that she walked into. And, and there's other things as well, but I, I don't know how anybody, and the new guy, that, what's his name again, the, the new OIG fellow. Jacobs. Um, Peter, yeah, Mr. Peterson, how we could ever make that work. And so when is this going to be implemented, do you think? Uh, it's, it's in the process of implementing right as we speak. So we It's being improved. So, for example, the copy you had, it looks a little bit different than we shared with you guys because you see we've done, they're called Plan, Do, Study, Acts. So mm -hmm. you start out with your original, you learn from it, and you modify it. I think that's the big thing that we're going to try to do with the Operation Swiss Watch. We're going to try things. We might make mistakes. We will not fail, but we might make mistakes. You learn from those small mistakes, and you then adjust the process in the program. Yeah, Senator Benson, we're just going to do one from Senator. We have just, to it's more of a comment than a, okay. than a question. I'm sure that system started out looking like that, and then various people ruined it, we fixed it. including <laughs> us. Um, so one of the benefits of corporate implementation of Lean Six Sigma is that there are managers specifically trained to keep doing this over and over and over. Tell me about how you are training the people that own the work to do continuous improvement and stop the barnacles. Because some of them need to come and tell us, no, this is not a problem that needs to be solved by writing something in statute. So please tell me how the managers are um, being trained. Take 30 seconds all the time. You 30 want. seconds, okay, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, the, the process is done, we involve managers when we're doing this process, okay? So they learn the culture, they learn tools as we're doing it. We have also implemented our own internal green belt training that we have various levels of the organization. We are not really funded for that, but we think there's such a need for that. So we are doing that as well. Uh, we are making sure that they're accountable for the control plan, as you know at Six Sigma, that are tied to this. So I know Robert uh, Jacobson, Bob Jacobson is uh, aware of that. He's involved with us constantly. He's doing a great job instilling that, that this will be the process that everybody has to adhere to. Sweet. Senator Graham, take 15 seconds. Real quick, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you on, for the work on this. It looks great, uh, much improvement. But just real quick, year to date, uh, how many cases have been opened or referred to CCAP investigators? So how many people will go through the new process? How many have, for this year? Yeah, we have built a awesome. shell already. We do not have, I want to be very, after last year, we want to be very sure when we give you data related to this that it's accurate. And at this point, we're building the shells, we're collecting it. We know we're going to have some by either later this year or early into 2020. Then I'll be able to share those kind of numbers. We don't have so you, don't, you don't know how many cases are open? Sorry. Well, let me, I'll just ask you a question for you. So, so maybe you could provide for us what, how many cases, like what the status? We just need an update because we're out of date oh, on that. Okay. So not from you, just from the okay, commission. You're, you're the design guy. So yes. That's not your department. Okay. You just tinker with it when it doesn't run and make it. Okay. So, and... This is remarkable. I wish we had a little more time, but this is actually kind of the highlight. And Commissioner, I hope as your tenure unfolds that there'll be many more celebrations like this where you've gone through the waiver programs and gone through so many other programs with these uh, amazing uh, Sigma, Six Sigma folks a year of credit. So yep. thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, so uh, we're still doing all right. Senator Hayden, while they're walking away. Good. Well, um, I, I'd like I just to want to, be, uh, but before they walk away, I just want to say uh, yeah. thank you for the work, and you, we, we did spend a lot of time on this. Um, but my, my words are to this body. Um, uh, Senator Abler, you said something or, or, or that said, how could Ms. Ham had ever been able to figure it out? That in other words, she was probably doomed from the beginning looking at that chart. Uh, we have spent a lot of time not demonizing people today about telling them about the process and the structure, but this body has demonized people. This body has called for people's heads. This body has pointed fingers at individual members uh, inside of DHS, and I think that that's unfortunate. So thank you for coming and helping us. And to us, we have to do so much better when, we start, when we're trying to figure out these issues other than the jump uh, uh, full-fledged and going after members of, uh, of the folks that work for us. I, I just don't think that that's fair, and I'm glad that you guys were able to help us understand that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Hi. I appreciate that comment from Senator Hayden, but I think also 
uh, at the table today was reference seeing the painful conversation that we had last year motivated them. It does make a positive difference in getting results when we do have these hearings, so they are productive. Thank you. I think we'll leave it. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I want to make sure Absolutely, we should have these hearings. We should have them all the time. We should have more of them. We should go well into the evening when we're in session. So I don't disagree with that. I just want to be clear that there were members of this body in this room that were pointing their fingers at specific individuals calling for their resignation. And I find that to be unconscionable. And I wanted to thank the folks that were here, including the commissioner and Mr. Swanson to help us identify what the underlying issue was, was the process, maybe not just the individual. I think we'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Senator Hayden. Um, Ms. Bartolik, uh, and so what I was really looking for here, it seemed to still be a shorter version of even what I was looking for, but I was just looking for a little update on these two programs that we're working on, and, and if you could, I know you have handouts and things, but it, I, even just a verbal five-minute discussion of both, like where is it at, where is the RFPs, and then I think maybe you and I can take some of this offline, if that would be all right, so I... Is, is that all right? Is that? That is just fine, Mr. Thanks. Chair. Uh, my name is Alex Bartolik. I'm with the Department of Human Services. And I'm here to talk with you about a project we call Waiver Reimagine, which is really a project about how do we shift the power? How do we help people with disabilities and their families have the ability to understand a system that's easier to understand, that focuses on what's important to them and for them, and makes the system easier to administer by counties and tribes and easier to deliver services by providers who are able to really design responsive services. So that's what we're going for with this. Our waiver system developed in bits and pieces with lots of different advocacy and lots of rules along the way. And this is an opportunity to say, what can we do to make it simpler? We did do a number of these process improvement projects with counties, with families, with providers to learn where our system supports them doing their best work and where it doesn't support them. And last year we did two re studies which we did provide to the legislature um, in looking at how we could make it easier, how we could make it so that there's information so people don't feel so helpless, that they can direct and drive what's important to them instead of being so dependent upon people within the system, that we can create more consistency and we can ultimately give better flexibility um, and customization of services as we're going through. So this waiver reimagine project talks about first a simplified menu of services. We have services that developed over time. We're not available to everybody. It depended which waiver you were on, whether you could get them. We want one menu of services that's easy to understand, broad categories, so people can say what's important to them and not worry about what service name to call it, but just know that we're able to deliver it. It, it will allow people, hopefully, to be able to just say that they meet any institutional level of care. We have four different disability waivers, and each waiver is based on eligibility for a certain level of care, and it does matter which one you can get on sometimes, and yeah, we don't want that. Um, I appreciate the overview, but can you just tell us like what's happened since the session? Yes. That's what I was So we are just, working like, on the- Are you hiring people or all that? Thank you. We um, are trying to get a couple of people hired. Mostly we're working on contracts. We need to go quickly and we need skill sets for some of this that might be different than what we currently have. We are working on the common menu of services. This will be prepared to go into CMS uh, in April. So we will be having it out for public comment. We are engaging with some assistance to be able to work out I have more outreach with families and providers to be able to really make sure we have identified the services and the standards appropriately, and then to develop a plan for how we would transition. They would go into effect in 21, January of 21 begin. Um, we have entered into, we are entering into a contract with a provider to help us work on the individualized budgeting. Um, we know that we have a concept. Our previous provider, our contractor did a lot of work. It needs a lot more nuance to go into exactly how would we design a level of benefit for people based on their needs, not based on what program they are on. So that contract is almost in place and the recommendations will be uh, ready by the fall of 2020. 
And then we are in the process also of looking at different plans for what would it take to consolidate the programs, and we are able to do that, uh, primarily with working with lead agencies and stakeholders to do this type of thing of the process improvement to make sure that we've really designed something that will work for people. Appreciate that. That's what I was looking for. Senator Hoffman, did you want to ask a question? Uh, Senator Abler, Mr. Chair, I just want to, Alec Bartolik, you have been an amazing worker. Uh, and, and I know this might be the last time you're in front of this committee, and it's, it saddens me, but I just want to say, um, Commissioner Harpstead, if you want an assistant commissioner that gets it, you should hire her, because um, <laughs> uh, understanding the full spectrum of, of how people with disabilities work, starting for early ages when you started doing early childhood. And I really want to take this moment to say thank you for your guidance and your mentoring and your caring about people with disabilities in this state. And you talk about trustworthy, that woman is trustworthy. There's never a time that, that anything that says, and I am going to absolutely miss you, um, uh, Alec, whatever. Bartol, you really are a, a gift to the state of Minnesota and have been, and your caring for people with disabilities is beyond anything anybody's ever seen in that department. So I always thank you for your reports. Thank you for your ability to call. Call out a shot as a shot. Um, I've never seen anybody take on Senator Abler in a committee like you have, and it just is a pretty <laughs> damn impressive. So um, you are real, and uh, I appreciate the realness about you, and I appreciate your your history, and I'm really going to miss you. Well, I think, Senator Soff, I was going to say the similar thing, so you and I'm just going to ditto it, except for that last joke part about taking me on. But, um, <laughs> that was the best part, okay. And, uh, and so we are going to miss you. Uh, but not before you give us one more update on EVV. Electronic <laughs> visit verification or Like EVV. where's the RFP at and that's the stuff I want to Yep, know. the RFP is um, getting ready to go to CMS. CMS has to approve this request for proposal before it can be issued. They are helping to pay. They also want to make sure that it's going to get us the product that we want. Uh, so we are in the process of finalizing the RFP and submitting it to CMS. We are very close within hours of submitting a good faith effort. There is a penalty assigned to states if they don't have this system up by January of 2020. Um, there is a provision for states to send in a good faith effort saying what they have done um, and to receive a, a delay um, authorization so there wouldn't be a penalty. Uh, we're just about ready to submit ours. It's due by November 20th. So far, we have seen a number of states submit them. All of them have been approved. A number are still in pending status. But we do believe that CMS is trying to honor states that are taking the appropriate steps. And so is that RFP public? To, what you're submitting, is that public? And so the people have just had some questions about where it's at and what about the statewide Thing and yep, all so that. right now the RFP, we cannot share information until we're authorized to release it for publication. All right. um, so my understanding is it's still, I will verify it, but my understanding is CMS is reviewing it, it to make sure that there's no changes before we make it public. Okay, and so we may actually have to, when that is public, we may actually want to talk about that mm -hmm. at, uh, with uh, more than five minutes. So, <laughs> um, okay. thanks. Any questions for anybody about that? So, um, I just appreciate the heads up. That was actually very nice. And we are going to miss you. And uh, I, I think you've just been a real asset to the state. And uh, you're the kind of person when you quit, they have to hire two or three people to replace you. It's true. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And the Department of Health. No, there is not the Department of Health anymore. Oh, it's, DHS. oh DHS. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. What? Sorry, my mistake. Oh, <laughs> sorry. A little senior moment there. Sorry. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair. Yeah, it's, a, it's it's good if it's if it's the right experience. That was that was good. I like that a lot. So uh, never go for being infallible. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pollock, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, about half hour on elderly waiver, maybe. Uh, Forty minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Dan <laughs> the value and who it serves and why and the outreach and the <laughs> benefits. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so actually, I asked you to come uh, to uh, just update us um, on the status of the RFP, and you'll and it's been extended, and but also to make sure people know what it's 
why it's so lengthy, and I just wanted to have you just take a few minutes about that, and I think the timing is perfect. So just go ahead and you can offer that to us. Okay, will, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair and uh, Senator Martin, Senator Hayden, yeah, all the committee members. Um, <clears throat> we did just publish an RFP for a small piece of last year's budget bill. It's on the Elderly Waiver uh, Customized Living Quality Improvement Grant. This was a small $500,000 annual appropriation that um, is really targeted at uh, those assisted living providers in our communities who are serving a disproportionate share of Medicaid elderly waiver participants. It's designed for those with 75% or higher um, in their residence. So um, it, it, it's the RFP I think is available to you here um, if you'd like to look at it. Uh, we recognize that it is, you know, these RFPs can be challenging for small providers. It's about 30 pages long um, to, you know, to get a grant of 20 to $200,000. Um, we did extend the deadline uh, another couple weeks through December 9th to give time. And um, I've been in personal communication with uh, some of the um, provider associations to try to get, you know, feedback and help uh, to solicit input and um, proposals from providers. You know, the, the bulk of this um, effort is really designed around uh, quality domains. And these are not, these were not chosen at random. These are not just us brainstorming. These were based on a um, more than 150 page research document by the University of Minnesota about how to improve assisted living, which we know has been a real challenge in Minnesota over the years. And these quality domains will be the basis for the report card that you authorized in last year's uh, legislation, the report card that will be um, informed by 60,000 uh, consumers and residents and family members about the assisted living quality experiences that they're having and will hopefully lead to um, improved tools for them to make selections in the future. So the grant will lend itself to helping the small providers in areas that uh, we know sometimes access is thin already. They will improve their quality in the areas that they will be graded on in future and we hope for a feedback loop that, that lends itself to better access. And I appreciate that and, and I was, and it, as I read it over, it's like, really, this is how much work it takes to create a $500,000 grant. And I was going to do the Six Sigma thing, except I couldn't do a long enough version of it. Like, really? This doesn't seem streamlined. But I wanted people to hear that the purpose of all that is actually, if they can, if this can help some of these very burdened, extremely, God bless them, high moral value providers that are serving 75% or more people in elderly waiver to find a way to actually comply with the assisted with the report card and, and all that, then a really good thing can happen. And so then I was persuaded immediately that that was actually a good thing. And I appreciate the, the extending the deadline a little bit. I'm told that maybe one third of the providers are not part of either group. And so I hope that they will know that that's available as well. And I, um, and this, and I don't know how much money we really, I mean, we've tried all kinds of ways to get more elderly waiver support from requiring it to yelling at them to, and now we're just going to try to keep the ones that are very on the high end open so they can con continue to serve as they have uh, the most commendable mission. So anybody else have a comment about that? Uh, perfect. Uh, and so, uh, Commissioner, you want to you wanna say goodbye? You've been here for all this. And goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a long day. So uh, we're going to work on something for December. I don't know what, uh, substance abuse, something like that. So with that word, Jordan, thank you everyone for your good attention. <laughs>